Welcome to a new episode of Many Path Lead to Om. Om. My name is Roland Heep. My name is Gary Streberg. Where do we come from? Where do we go to? And why are we even here? We ask the big questions and of course we don't have an answer. But we'll try anyway. Today with a guest Daniel Pinchbeck, renowned author, thinker, speaker, filmmaker and activist. And I'm sure I forgot a whole lot of other things. Uh, as this is usually a German language podcast, I quickly want to apologize to all our listeners who do not speak English. Please uh, wait, stand by for a second. Tut mir leid, dass wir heute Englisch uh, reden, aber wir versprechen euch, das nächste Mal gibt es wieder im verständlichen Alemannischen einen Podcast. Ja. Uh, heute aber, da unser Gast Amerikaner ist, auf Englisch. Aber vielleicht hört ihr trotzdem zu, denn vielleicht könnt ihr ja viel besser Englisch, als ihr denkt und nehmt zumindest ein bisschen was mit. Genau. Um, und wie gesagt, next time... It's German again. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're back now in, in English land. Uh, so um, our guest today, Daniel Pinchbeck, most of you will probably know his name. He is uh, the writer and author of Breaking Open the Head, which was one of the seminal books about, I would say, the new wave or the third wave of psychedelics. I think it came out in 2002, in which he chronicled his uh, experiments with all kinds of uh, psychedelic substances, ayahuasca, ibogaine, DMT, DPT, whatever you name it, it's in there. Um, and uh, yeah, as I said, I think it was one of the first books that uh, kind of set the new wave of psychedelics in motion and uh, gave a lot of people uh, the inspiration to also try out mm. some of these substances. Um, he uh, uh, wrote another book um, in 2006 called 2012, The Return of Quetzalcoatl. This book was more about uh, uh, the idea of prophecy and, and how does prophecy work, uh, where does prophecy come from. And um, of course it uh, talked also about the whole meme of the change that 2012 would probably bring, the Mayan prophecy um, and all that stuff. Uh, he also contributed and edited books like Notes from the Edge Times and uh, of course now his newest book is How Soon Is Now. Uh, and that is also out in Germany and it's uh, it was published by the Scorpio Verlag and in Germany it's called How Soon Is Now Wie lange wollen wir noch warten? Ein Manifest gegen die Apokalypse uh, It has a subtitle, we talk about this later with Daniel So um, he also has been involved in uh, documentary movies like 2012 Time for Change He has been the co-founder of the web magazine Reality Sandwich The Evolver Network Uh, and of course, he's written countless articles for New York Times Magazine, New York Times Book Review, The Village Voice, and on and on. And and, and also, he hosts a podcast, uh, which is also called How Soon Is Now. Yes. I think there's about 11 episodes online so far, and he has quite some interesting guests there, like Lynn McTaggart or Anthony Peake. Uh, so I really recommend everybody to check that out. A very, very interesting conversations he is having there. Um, so, and uh, hopefully we also have an interesting conversation with Daniel today in our podcast. Uh, we only had about an hour, which um, is, is a good time, and we don't want to complain. Thanks, Daniel, for taking the time. But of course, uh, considering the wide range of subjects that Daniel tackles in his new book, uh, we cannot really delve very deep into all of those. So I would say it's mostly an appetizer, a teaser, if you will. Uh, and hopefully it will inspire you to pick up his book, which is really, really fantastic. And uh, he talks about it in the interview that for some reason uh, it's not really getting the traction that he thought it would. And it surprised me too. And we talk a little yeah. bit about that, mm -hmm. but I can really s recommend it to anybody. And uh, as we mentioned, it's available, of course, in English and uh, also now in German. Um, and for our German uh, listeners, uh, Daniel will also be in Germany actually pretty soon uh, in Berlin from the 11th to the 14th Ju of July. There's going to be the Tech Open Air Conference. Uh, we will link to the website and uh, he's uh, scheduled to speak there. I don't know exactly what day, but I'm sure you can check that out on the uh, website. And also uh, he told us he's going to be at the Breaking Convention in London. So hopefully we'll meet him there and uh, continue our conversation maybe even. Yeah. So uh, I think, uh, well, without further ado, uh, let's uh, jump into the uh, conversation with Daniel Pinchbeck. Here we go. So hello, Daniel Pinchbeck. Uh, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here and uh, taking the time to talk to us. 
Um, we have already introduced you, so I think uh, also I think most people will probably be uh, aware who you are. But uh, to the few that are not, maybe you can just give us a very quick introduction to yourself. Sure. Uh, well, I'm a I'm a author. I've written a few books. Uh, my first book, Breaking Open the Head, is on psychedelic shamanism. Uh, it came out about 15 years ago. Uh, my second book was uh, 2012, The Return of Quetzalcoatl. Uh, that came out about 10 years ago. And uh, that book looked at prophecies of uh, indigenous cultures like the Maya and the Hopi um, in relationship to contemporary thinkers and modern philosophers and a lot of things that are happening in our world now. And then I have a new book, uh, How Soon Is Now, which just came out uh, over the last months. And that book kind of uh, seeks to um, look at the problems that are facing us as a planetary community and propose sort of, a, I guess you could say, a blueprint for the future or, or a way we could make a transition to a different uh, operating system for human society. Yeah, in, in Germany, the book has a subtitle. Uh, it's called How Long... Uh, it's, it's, of course, it's also called How Soon Is Now. It's still mm -hmm. maintained the English title. Yeah. But then it also adds the subtitle How Much Longer Will We Wait? I mean, I'm, I'm translating it to English. Uh, in Germany, it's Wie lange wollen wir noch warten? Ein Manifest gegen die Apokalypse. Uh, how much longer will we wait or do we want to wait? A manifesto against the apocalypse. So I think that sets a, kind of a stage... Um, Maybe you can also add a little bit about it. Like, where are we at as a species right now? How, where do you see us um, in, in terms of how long do we have on this planet? I think Stephen Hawking recently came out with a quote saying, like, uh, we basically have 100 years after that we, we perish or we go to another planet. So what, what is your uh, opinion about And Maybe it, you can also tell us a little bit about where are the main problems of, of our planet right now. Sure. Yeah. I mean, well, obviously, it's a very you know. There's a lot of factors involved. Um, you know. So, uh, but I mean, I, I can see Hawking's point. Uh, it definitely looks like we um, are kind of in danger of hitting a lot of you know critical feedbacks in terms of what we're doing to the eco ecosystems of the planet, and uh, also we're exhausting a lot of the resources that our technological society uh, requires to keep going. Uh, and, yeah, so, I mean, you know, probably the most dire pieces, pieces of, the, of information include the loss of biodiversity, you know, the idea that we're losing something like 10% of the Earth's remaining biodiversity for 10 to 15 years, um, something like 150 species a day or something going extinct. And uh, ocean acidification, because the oceans are absorbing a lot of the CO2, the oceans are 30% more acidic than they were 40 years ago. And uh, obviously, uh, climate change, global warming, uh, as we, uh, you know, pass, we recently passed 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And we know the last time there was this much CO2, temperatures were, four, uh, I think, four degrees Celsius warmer and sea levels were somewhere between 50 and 100 feet higher. So that's the tra trajectory and there are kind of uh, reasons to believe that it doesn't just happen incrementally. There are sudden like spikes um, as the whole system kind of uh, changes into a new steady state. Uh, so yeah, I mean, however, as as you know, hard as that is to conceive of, you know, if we were to have a waking up tomorrow as a, as a collective. If humanity was to suddenly realize that we had to work together, uh, almost like in, like the cells in an organism, to deal with what we've unleashed, you know, we probably could avoid a lot of the most dire consequences, and actually, uh, you know, continue, uh, uh, you know, as a species for a long time, and, and ultimately find our, our niche and, and figure out how to uh, flourish and thrive uh, without uh, depleting uh, the ecosystems. Yeah, uh, I think that's what I really liked a lot about your book that, of course, in the first, uh, I don't know, 30 pages, 50 pages, uh, you kind of de have to deal as a reader also with all the dire news. I mean, most of us are, of course, aware of what is going on, but just to read it in such a condensed form and really being confronted with it kind of leaves you, okay, now we have to do something. And uh, what I really liked about your book, first of all, is your still your optimism. You know, you, you, you're not like, oh, my God, it's all doom and gloom. Uh, but you, you really have a very optimistic streak 
uh, in that and and where where does that come from why are you not like oh my god it's all over now <laughs> well i mean it would obviously be possible to have that attitude and there are you know many who do but i mean you know i guess you know life is inherently incredibly mysterious and also magical i mean if we think about the improbable nature of our existence on this planet Uh, I mean, obviously, scientists try to make the argument that it's just that, you know, something happened through physical evolution, accidents. But um, yeah. I guess my view tends to be a little bit more uh, mystical, uh, and particularly because I had so many experiences in, in shamanism and with tribal people working with visionary plants like ayahuasca and iboga and, and peyote and so on and mushrooms. The, the sort of insight one gets from a lot of those types of experiences, if you take it seriously, is that there's there's a much deeper mystery uh, of consciousness uh, itself uh, on a kind of evolutionary trajectory. Uh, and there may be other levels of psychic reality, other dimensions of consciousness. And I don't think that, you know, the, the, the Earth did all of this work to get us to this point, uh, just to uh, now annihilate, you know, us and, and end this experiment. Uh, so, you know, in some form, humanity is going to continue and evolve and um, you know my hope and I guess the prayer of the book is that it could really be uh, something that 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 you know th through a kind of revolution that's uh, empathic and, and spiritual it could become a mission for humanity to uh, to, to make this evolution together uh, ra rather than it requiring you know some type of horrible catastrophes mass depopulations nuclear wars you know and so on and I do think that that is available to us it's just a question of people awakening to uh, the potential yeah maybe maybe before we get to that in a more specific way uh, we can talk about what actually happened why did we as a species get to this really dire point i mean i think that's connected of course to the to uh, mm. what can we do now but uh, why why are we so disconnected and and what happened there do you have any uh, opinion about that Yeah, I, mean, I, I talk about that in the book, too. I mean, you know, there are different ways to language that, right? But, I mean, essentially, you know, certain things happened in Western civilization that led to kind of a separation from nature. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and you can even, I think, go back to the, you know, previous, like even like the, you know, Hindu Aryan culture and kind of a transcendental religious perspective, which then, then led in the West to a kind of separation of spirit and matter, a sort of denigration of matter. Uh, ultimately, an idea that uh, you know there's something guilty and shameful about 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 you know physical existence and the human body and sexuality mm -hmm. and so on, and this this separation was reified in social institutions and a dominator civilization and patriarchy, uh, property laws, pri private property, the Enclosure Act, and then as part of this separation, we actually developed some new capacities. We were able to kind of explore and seek to manipulate matter. Uh, in a way that we never had before. We developed kind of perspective uh, in the Renaissance where we kind of separated ourselves out from the frame and, and suddenly recognized the kind of kind of we, we became we became, became kind of aware of the space and the matter around us in a new way and that allowed us to develop science and technology and engineering which allowed us to manipulate uh, matter in, in more and more intensive ways. Uh, so that, that also be, that all became kind of like a self-propelling, mechanism that led to the industrial revolution to the post-industrial revolution to global capitalism to imperialism you know to a kind of uh, extraction based uh, exploitative based economy and to a mindset that ultimately led to a sense that uh, we're totally separate that nature has no spirit that there is no god uh, and to our kind of modern nihilistic condition Uh, if I correctly remember when I read your first book that you basically also were more of a materialistic, uh, had more a materialistic point of view before you had your um, psychedelic experience. Is that correct? Or I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Yeah. But I, I was, a, you know, I, I believed, in the, you know, entirely in, in the limited scientific rational worldview. Which basically argue, argued that uh, you know you know you know and I'm still I still believe that, in fact I believe that my work is actually quite scientific and, and rational mm -hmm. but it's a kind of expanded rationality but uh, you know so for instance the, you know when I was growing up the scientific viewpoint 
was that consciousness, you know, could only be brain based. So it was only an epiphenomena of matter that had to do with, you know, accidents in, in our evolutionary trajectory. And therefore, there was no possibility of a consciousness or any kind of aspect of one's uh, existence or one's soul or spirit uh, existing uh, in any form after death. And I think this ultimately leads to a very, um, you know, nihilistic idea in, in a sense that, the, you know, we don't really feel much desire to, to protect, you know, the, the, the earth for future generations. Mm. We kind of lose contact with that. But I also feel that that isn't a rigorous idea. It, it's, it's simply an idea and that actually you can have, uh, you can explore these other dimensions of, of experience and discover that uh, the world is, is more kind of uh, Jungian uh, or mystical uh, in, in ways that, uh, or psychic uh, in, in ways that are totally beyond that, that narrow rational worldview. Mm -hmm. So uh, in your book, you basically also propose now that if we, if we want to do the big changes that we need to change exactly that, that we have to reconnect with nature, but also with the mm, mystical viewpoint, mm. and uh, what what's your idea how we can achieve that? Because it seems to be that that is really not that easy. And I mean, it's easy on a, on an individual basis in a way because everybody can just take a whole bunch of psychedelics and and do meditation and you know. But how can we um, change a, a large portion of of the population to uh, accept? that we are in a bad situation, that we have to do drastic measures to uh, to save our human race, in a sense. Well, you're kind of asking me a number of questions there that are kind of like, um, you know, kind of kind of mixed together. It's a lot. It's a lot to answer. But um, uh, kind but, of towards maybe the last point. Um, oh, go ahead. What were you going to say? Yeah. Uh, then maybe let's start with uh, how can an individual uh, get back this connection that we seem to have lost over the last few hundred years here, at least in the Western world? Well, I mean, actually, I do see many people doing that. I mean, uh, and there are all sorts of uh, methods for it. Um, you know, there's esoteric, I mean, a lot of new, you know, esoteric systems and old esoteric systems are available for people, you know, from, from yoga and meditation. You know, I mean, I think that the the influence of kind of the post new age spiritual culture is important. You know, people like Eckhart Tolle yeah. and you know, Thich Nhat Hanh and Dalai Lama and so on. Uh, and then also, um, you know, kind of the uh, more kind of like, you know, I intellectual approach which, which sit, sees the connections between uh, that, that metaphysical perspective and, and science, you know, so people like Fridhoff Capra or Dean Radin or, you know, Amit Swami or uh, Bruce Lipton, Mm -hmm. uh, all, all these, all these people, I think, are reflecting kind of an emergent uh, new paradigm. Uh, you know, for me, it's been interesting with this book because I feel I, I, I was hoping the book would integrate and synergize different audiences and different communities. But so far, it's almost seemed like the opposite. It seemed like the book is too mystical for kind of uh, people who are, are rational uh, or, or define themselves, you know, in a kind of mainstream rationality a way to, to even give it a look mm -hmm. and to and to you know and, and to uh, rational for people who are kind of part of the, the and, and maybe grounded for people who are part of a kind of post new age culture to, to focus on it so I, it's actually feels sort of caught in between in, in, a, in a way that I thought was going to be helpful for the message of the book but it's, it's turned out to, to, to hinder it huh, uh, that, that's interesting um, I mean my personal reading it, it was actually perfect because it fit both sides mm. it was as you say For me as well yeah. yeah there was the the materialistic view and and it also i mean we talk about this a little later maybe about there were specific ideas also how we can change things and it's not just uh on a philosophical basis but it also acknowledges that fact that we have disconnected ourselves from nature from ourselves i mean our, our true selves and and you give uh some ideas and of course Uh, your earlier books delve way much deeper into that. Um, so people who are interested in that, of course, I, we always recommend um, to your first two books, for example. But it's all there. So uh, it's interesting. Why do you think that that is? I mean, have you spoken to materialist people who say, oh, that's all mambo jumbo? Or, uh, I mean, that's I, for me, it was perfect in a way. It's, mm. It was perfect middle ground. But, you know. 
Well, it's really good to hear that, but I'm just, you know, in terms of the actual book sales and particularly the lack of uh, ability to get mainstream uh, review attention has, has critically hampered uh, the book's ability to reach an audience. Uh, so, for instance, you know, The Guardian told a journalist that it was too far out for them to cover. Uh, the New York Times hasn't reviewed it. Um, and somehow something, I think, with this book, you know, people also, you know, maybe it's not, maybe it's not exactly the same in Germany, but it's certainly the U.S., I feel that people have lost the habit of, of wanting to be intellectually challenged, uh, and maybe they're too scared of the ecological subject mm. to even uh, want, you know, be willing to, to make an engagement. Uh, but somehow or, or other, at this point, and I, I mean, I'm still, I'm still trying to figure it out. You know, the, I, I thought the book was perfectly pitched, you know, for for the moment that we're in. But uh, it, ha it hasn't been reaching that resonance with a large uh, audience that I that I had uh, anticipated. Yeah, I mean, it's also interesting in a way that is is the are the ideas not um, is are you, are you ahead of your time in a way, which of course would be t terrible because, as you say in your book, we're basically running out of time, and uh, we cannot wait till more people accept that. But because if, if it would just be a book about like the far outside, I would understand that. But now. You kind of pushed it. Actually, I mean, it's 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 it has a part in the book, but most. Of, I mean, we're talking about it now, but actually, I think most of the part book is actually about specific uh, ways to deal with the crisis. It's not so much mm. just about uh, esoteric ideas, or you know, it's it, so. It's it's really. Are, are you ahead of your time, or uh, is? Well, I, I mean, I've already had that experience. I mean, when when I published Breaking Open the Head, it came out in two thousand two. Mm -hmm. At that point, you know, in the mainstream discourse in the United States, you couldn't even talk about psychedelics seriously. You would right. just get laughed at. The New York Times still called them like toys of the hippie generation. You know, there was no research on them. And I, and I do feel that that book, you know, had the effect of helping to shift uh, the cultural discourse around psychedelics. And, totally. and now that's really become uh, not, not, a, not even a, you know, I mean, not even a discussion anymore. Like, you know, even, even the New Yorker and the New York Times have to admit that, you know, the value of these experiences and, you know, more and more is coming out about, about the benefits of them. Yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> everywhere, everywhere you look now. And it's also over here in Germany, I think there's a lot of discussion and uh, we have a lot of research going on in that area. So, yeah, I, I remember uh, when I found that book, I think it was in a bookstore in London after it came out. And it was one of the first books I personally read uh, delved into really when about these topics because uh, yeah I I was interested in those topics before and I read some of the older stuff but it was basically one of the first of the would say the new wave of psychedelic explorers uh, that that really made a kind of a big impact what but you say was it in the beginning also that the sales weren't as good and it just picked up after a while uh, you know th that book had a slow and steady build over over, over uh, a, a, you know quite a long period of time, and um, yeah, so so you know m maybe it'll ha the same thing will happen uh, with this book. I mean, nobody wants to hear an author grousing about you know how how they feel about their the book sale. Well, much. no, I, that that's kind of true, but I think it's it speaks a little more about like what are the deeper uh, issues or deeper reasons for that. That's what I'm looking for. You know, it's not like. Uh, I want to, <laughs> I want to give you a good feeling. Of course, I want to do that too. But also, you know, like, uh, why don't people respond, and why are actually like the media so uh, against, like, just even reviewing it? I mean, they could write a bad review <laughs> if they don't like it. But a bad review would be much better than, than right. no cover. Uh, in fact, a friend of mine was telling me about this experiment where they, um, uh, you know, took these seeds. Oh, I think it was rice grains, and had people either put like bad thoughts, uh, yeah. good. Thoughts, so just ignore them, you know, into the rice grains, and the ones that were ignored, you know, really withered. And the ones that were, uh, even the ones that had bad thoughts into them, did better, you know. Yeah, what, so, what well, they say: bad publicity is better than good public, uh, better than no publicity. That's why I'm saying. You know, anyway, I, you know, yeah. I, I can't explain. It may just take a while. Uh, I do think it's ahead of its time, and now I have to figure out other ways to get, you know, the the ideas into the culture. Right. Uh, I, I thought it would be obvious to, to, to more people that, that this was something important to consider right now. But, yeah. But I, then let's continue with that because I think one of the big uh, 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 ideas which I really res uh, responded to was the whole idea of initiation that you talk about. Maybe you can uh, 
tell our listeners a little bit about that what 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 we live what what is what we kind of forgot there mm. and what do we need to do there on on that end yes yeah, so i mean um you know all around the world indigenous traditional cultures have rites of passage or initiations that often involve you know going through some kind of ordeal or taking psychedelic plants or doing a fast or a vision quest and uh, these events are seen as necessary thresholds between uh, adolescence and adulthood. Mm. One theory of the book is that we're undergoing something like that at a species level, um, because now our global postmodern civilization has done away with these rites of passage. Mm -hmm. People don't really reach a state of adult maturity where they're able to take, take, become aware of themselves as a sort of an aspect of, of the greater whole. And uh, also recognize that there are, you know, other uh, stories that it isn't just about their own little individual ego. That there, that there's, you know, the, the earth as an entity and, and, and their soul having continuity and so on. So I feel without that, people are just trapped into an immature state. And in a way, like Trump is the, the perfect uh, collective projection of this kind of ego-based, narcissistic, uninitiated society that uh, it seems to be yeah, pushing towards its own apotheosis through destruction at this point. Yeah, right. That's that's really interesting that that guy happened right now at this point in history. And uh, yeah, uh, so, so uh, are there any ideas about initiation in, in our society? I mean, how can we get that back? Because I think I, I, I think you really hit a very good point there when uh, I, when I look at myself, when I look at my friends, and also when I look at my kid, I mean, you, you see that they are kind of looking also to get some kind of initiation. Uh, kind of people really want it, but they don't know ex actually what they want. And the society doesn't offer them basically any any way to do it. Yeah, well, you know, it, 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 you know it's apparently biologically hardwired into us to seek these kind of uh, transcendent, transpersonal experiences. And if we can't do it in a, in a creative and positive way with the guidance of elders, you know, and, and it, you know, some kind of process that, that actually brings light to the world, then it, then it can go dark. Mm -hmm. And you can have initiation through war or initiation through, uh, you know, catastrophe. Uh, and, you know, I guess what I'm proposing in the book is if we become consciously aware that this is playing out, uh, then we can see the, the, you know, the global crisis we're facing we can take it as take it on as, as our kind of uh, personal and collective initiation or rite of passage and we can say by rising to this occasion you know giving up maybe certain types of short-term benefits that society provides if you use your talents and your skills to sell shitty products or you know market you know things that don't really need to exist uh, and instead say no I'm, I'm not going to do that I'll, I'll take the more difficult path the initiation path and um, see what I can do with my with my talents and my skills you know for for the the, the community of life uh, if enough people made that type of commitment then, then we might make a big step in that direction that yeah that's a good point you also I think what another point we t you talked about Joseph Chilton Pierce uh, just to go back a little bit to the kind of biological uh, need for initiation um, can you talk about that a little bit Oh uh, yeah, he wrote a great book called *The Biology of Transcendence*, right. and he basically argues, as I said, that that initiation, the, the need for some type of initiation, is hardwired into us. That it may almost have like a neurophysiological basis. That like, you know, the the the, the most recent part of our brain, the part that makes us human, I guess, is like the prefrontal cortex, which develops kind of our ability to process symbols, to think abstractly, but also gives us a very strong and separate sense of ego identity of self. And um, without without a initiation, without a transpersonal breakthrough, it's almost like we're trapped. We're walled into that uh, sense of self, which is you know definitely what I felt uh, before before I discovered psychedelics. And um, you know, not that it heals everything to have those those experiences, and, and in fact, you know, the, it could even maybe cause problems at times. But um, you know, by having that that transpersonal reckoning. Uh, you 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 know you kind of rewire yourself you know so so um, so yeah that's his theory and I like it a lot yeah I, I love this guy he's, he's really really great and uh, 
I think if just when I look at my my son, he's now twelve. You can see that he has been basically for the last twelve years developing his ego now, and in a few years or pretty soon, I guess that would be a good time uh, to have this kind of expanded consciousness in some way. Of course, I don't want to give my son psychedelics, uh, but uh, at least not at that <laughs> age. But uh, <coughs> it's actually it's really a, a good point because you can see the development, and then you look at myself and our generation mostly i mean we are in our 40s and and uh we never had at least over here in germany we didn't have a war we didn't have famine we didn't have any major disasters catastrophes we were never really tested in the outside so far and uh there was no need for initiation and i think you also coined or no you didn't coin it but you used the word kid a lot and and that's true i mean that's what a lot of people are and that's what i am probably still <laughs> uh, quite a bit but these uh, experiences you're talking about they are the really the ones that give you a glimpse into the larger world wasn't Star Wars mm, <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah well it's feeling very Star Wars these days um, you know uh, Trump's uh, chief strategist Bannon has actually compared himself to Darth Vader favorably right isn't that weird <laughs> <laughs> well I don't think it's weird it just shows you how uh, you know in young terms these archetypes have been powerfully activated in the collective psyche mm -hmm. that, that they find particularly kind of vehicles or vessels to express themselves. I mean, Jung, Jung would see this all as part of the, uh, you know, the, the archetype of apocalypse, you know, unfolding in our time. Right. So, um, maybe, maybe we can go to more like specific ideas. I think uh, that's what I, I, I like to that you really give a few or actually quite a few ideas what we can all do i mean i think that's very important to, to ask the question what can i do uh, uh, and also what can we do in, in smaller groups or a bigger collective and then of course we have to talk how do we get people to do that because i think one of some of your ideas uh, as as sensible as they are sound like they are pretty hard to have people convinced to do them uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about those Sure, but I, you know, I, I sort of, you know, to, to for ease of understanding, I sort of separated it into three big areas, and those three big areas are the technical infrastructure aspects, kind of the social system aspects, and then kind of the area of like consciousness, uh, which is shaped by like culture and media and education and ideology and religion and so on. And on the technical side, you know, the main areas that I discuss in the book, although there are a couple of others that I didn't really go into are kind of energy uh, infrastructure, farming, agriculture, and uh, industry, I say the three big areas. And um, you know, with energy, we know we need to shift to renewables. I know Germany is kind of you know, doing that to some extent. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, you know, even the, the, the Paris Accord you know, is, is, you know, asks for a much smaller level of transformation than we actually need. Uh, and you know, if we really were to think about it, you know, we, we could shift to renewable energy infrastructure very quickly if it wasn't for the uh, political and economic uh, impediments. Mm -hmm. There's nothing stopping us from retooling uh, factories and retraining people to put in the solar panels. And we have plenty of people around and we have the materials and, 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 and the blueprints. Uh, so the obstruction is somewhere else. And uh, if we look at the past, there are times when humanity, you know, human societies have rallied uh, to do something rapidly. Uh, so, for instance, after the uh, Pearl Harbor bombing of the Second World War, uh, the U.S. you know changed all of its factories in a few months to wartime production. Uh, didn't let people get new cars and so on until the war was over. And they taxed the wealthy members of the population at something like 94 percent, and used all of those resources to uh, bring about this change. And something like that is really what we need right now because what we're facing ecologically, uh, you know, could 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 be incredibly drastic if we don't if we don't address it. Yeah, I, I was actually reminded of this famous quote that Ronald Reagan once yeah, gave, yeah, it, yeah. Uh, you know, where he said like, if aliens would attack, we would all come together and be one species. And uh, I was wondering why don't we see the current situation basically as the alien attack, even though it's actually us attacking ourselves, but. Uh, because it's basically that is the common cause that could 
get humanity together actually if you if you think about it yeah but but isn't it isn't it like like uh, when you um, tell a smoker that it's not uh, not good for you you're smoking every every no smoker knows by now that that um, smoking is not good and uh, um, and he will smoke it anyway so um, so maybe maybe is this this kind of, of um, mentality like an addiction like in a way. I mean it's basically it's an no no it, it, it's uh, the the harm is not immediate we we live in Germany mm. so we have yes we have some storms or some some heavy rain or but but no earthquakes no no uh, uh, um, um, stuff uh, uh, like like uh, for instance in, in in the US so so we are safe most of uh, of our society Yeah, I don't know. Does it have to get worse? Yeah. Yeah, uh, it looks like it has to get worse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we need Godzilla <laughs> to to come together. Well, we're gonna have a lot of Godzilla, but um, yeah. I mean, the problem is that uh, it could tilt society in the wrong direction, and already is doing that. So, for instance, I see this this movement of authoritarian regression that we're seeing mm -hmm. is already mm -hmm. very much about uh, climate change and resource depletion. Mm -hmm. You know, so like the you know one of the main reasons for the refugees in Syria and the war there are the droughts, which are climate change right. caused. Those big refugee populations led to Brexit. So uh, you know, and, and in a sense, also led to Trump because now there's so much fear of uh, immigration and refugees and terrorists and so on. So so the whole thing is is sort of you know, tightening up and moving in the wrong direction because, you know, we may have millions of refugees now, we may have tens of millions or hundreds of millions 10 years from now. Right. And right. Uh, we should be, we should be really thinking about the type of systemic uh, redesign that we need on all levels to, uh, to deal with this, the, the, the changes that are going to be happening. Yeah. I mean, but, but why, why is this not the big thing? Like in, why isn't that on the news every day? I mean, if it, It's, it's such a big thing, as you just said, because we had this uh, whole refugee crisis in, in Germany a year ago. We, we had uh, over a million people coming in, and uh, I think it, it went kind of well. But of course, we also had a rise in, in right-wing uh, thought and, and, and right-wing parties gaining s uh, strength. And as you just said, it's gonna, there are going to be way more f refugees coming in, in the next few years. So, uh, and that's just one aspect. I mean, of course, there's also the... Uh, ecological crisis and and also actually the financial crisis which only a f very few people actually uh, gain from and so you know it's such an imminent danger why don't we just sit around and and, and, and do we have it on the news all day every day uh, well I mean we're not trained to be uh, systemic and comprehensive design design thinkers in, in this you know, in, a, in our current paradigm And for most, for most of the part, people are rewarded, have been rewarded by doing you know more short-term uh, narrow thinking, and that type of thinking is is reinforced in closed loops by the whole media system, mm -hmm. you know, which tells you to be scared of something happening, you know, the, the next bomb or the next this or the next that or whatever, but but doesn't really give us a systemic model for the things that are happening on a deep level and the type of changes that that need to happen, and you know it also it also feeds into You know, humanity's, you know, more like a lower chakra, you know, impulses, you know, right. like, uh, right. but most people just want to be comfortable immediately. They don't want to think about too much. They want to be allowed to sleep. Uh, and, um, you know, we're, we're going to be sort of thrown into a circumstance uh, where that's, that's really not going to be possible anymore. I mean, it's it's very similar to any individual. I mean, Gary just mentioned the smoking problem, and I think that's uh, with all changes inside yourself. I mean, uh, I personally would probably avoid all changes as much as I can, and only change when it's really necessary. And exactly. uh, I think that seems to be the case for humanity as a whole, too. Yeah, but you know, we have to recognize, though. I mean, and it's funny in a way, the right wing have been better at long-term planning in, in many respects than, than the progressives. Maybe it's because they're more unified or something. I mean, one of the things that really uh, instigated me to write this book was learning about the neoliberal economists and, and, and Milton Friedman, uh -huh. uh, who um, recognized you know, they didn't like uh, the liberalization of society, the deeper equalization of wealth, the stronger middle class. You know, that was leading to protests and people thinking for themselves. 
and so on. And so they wanted to go back to more like oligarchy and privatization, but they realized that their ideas were not popular yet. So they actually waited like 10, 15 years and they built up a sort of infrastructure of think tanks and research institutes and, you know, kind of uh, magazines. And then when the Berlin Wall happened in 1989, they were able to go into the Eastern Bloc and say, okay, now the way to get prosperous is everybody privatizes their state resources, you sell them to the highest bidder, you know, and so that that ideology then led to, you know, Putin and, and, and all this stuff. So if we, if we can definitely see that, that the time that we're, you know, we're heading towards another paroxysm of crises uh, that, that, you know, are gonna be very profound, you know, that, then the time would be now to Ha- develop, you know, both an ideological understanding, a kind of comprehensive perspective, and also some alternative institutions and, and structures that, that can be put in place uh, when, when crisis comes. But at the moment, you know, f- from judging from the response to the book so far, people really don't want to hear it, they don't want to think about it, they don't want to deal with it. Hmm. Well, I hope that, uh, <laughs> I mean, at least, you know, us and, and other people can at least... Uh help a little bit with that and uh, I mean uh, you also mentioned the media which of course we are part of so it, I was very interested to read that and that actually uh, the way we tell stories might be uh, some agent of change if you will uh, of the consciousness um, can you elaborate a little bit on that yeah well, I think you know media has an incredibly powerful role in, in postmodern society Uh, I really like uh, Antonio Negri, this Italian political philosopher, talks about this idea of the production of subjectivity, uh, that essentially, um, yeah, like, uh, you know, in Marx's day, in the 19th century, there was like the the hegemony of uh, material production, which was like stuff, like typewriters and and furniture and so on. And now we have this sort of hegemony of immaterial production, which is things like Facebook and Uber and you know, systems for, for effect, creating effective relationships between people, platforms that mediate uh, relationships and so on. But what's really being constructed through this sort of media and, and networking and all that stuff is subjectivity itself, and it's being given a certain focus in a certain direction. So I find that very exciting because, in theory, uh, we could also produce quite quickly a different kind of subjectivity a more engaged subjectivity, uh, you know, where, where it becomes kind of hip and exciting to, you know, understand your relationship to the local ecology, to build uh, multi-generational communities, to scale down consumption, to think about new paradigms, like kind of uh, degrowth or new ways to, to manage uh, resources or create zero waste uh, systems. Uh, it's just a question of what the media is constantly telling people to do and glamorizing. Right, like change the story, basically, and and also I think in in fiction, I think it's uh, we were talking the other day, like where is Star Trek when you need it in a way? I mean, not I mean I like the new movies, but if you think about how the old show basically presented a, a future where people seem to have uh, gone beyond our current crisis and have solved it in with a communal effort and now work together for peace, and that was in my youth an example and these days it seems like uh, especially um, all young adult craze is always very dystopian in its uh, in its content and um, I'm kind of wondering is that also maybe a part of why there's so much nihilism still in, in so many people yeah I mean you know we're, we're clearly at the um, you know we're at, a, we're at a point in the sort of archetypal process I mean the I really like, you know, the work of Stan Groff, mm-hmm. uh, and um, you know, like he looks at the birthing process as this kind of archetype where there's different stages in it, and we're kind of in like the the dark tunnel stage where you're, oh, where yeah. you're going through the canal. There feels like there's no way out, and everything is just closing in on you, and uh, you know, all of our, our our media, which which is part of a projection of the collective psyche in a sense, is kind of reinforcing that uh, that idea, you know. So basically now we can have to help the birthing and, and uh, open up and so that we can see the light so that people can actually work towards that in a way. Exactly. Yeah. No, that's, that's a good, good way. Um, so, but now just go back a little bit to is, is it actually possible to wake up everyone? I mean, uh, few people listen to this podcast, few people read your book, 
you know, there's certainly an amount of uh, people who are trying to wake up. Let's put it like that. And, and some are more and some are less. And is that enough or is there actually something which will help everyone to get that? Is there is there a possibility? Because it seems like it's I mean, there's billions of people on this planet who probably don't are not interested in any of the stuff we're talking about right now. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, you know, I, I think there's a, you know, a, a differentiation of function in, uh, in, the, in the human species. You know, it's almost kind of like, uh, you know, people have different tendencies and traits and roles. So, you know, not everybody has to wake up, but everybody could, you know, would, would be this, you know, would be able to exist in, in a culture that was based on uh, like regenerative principles. And they could they could be, you know, made part of that culture um you know just just because the the the, the sort of framing has shifted um, so for instance like you know if you're a catholic uh you know the pope francis issued this uh this epistle this, this essay care for our common home mm -hmm. where he basically argued that you know intrinsic to catholicism should be an ecological imperative uh where uh you know we take care of the environment and Wealthy people should see that they should sacrifice some of their wealth to contribute to the common good, and so on. Now, if that, you know, is is something that becomes part of Catholic doctrine, you know, you have an infrastructure of Catholic uh, churches and, and schools. You know, that could that there could be a billion people around the world who are being trained in principles that accord with caring for our common home. And those would include like bio, bioremediation and permaculture, renewable energy, and so on. Uh, so, you know, ju just based on, the, on their own embed embedding, embeddedness in that Catholic ideology, they could be they could be uh, you know uh, helps to make that type of shift. Right. And also, I think you mentioned the the uh, whole idea of the tipping point, the the Sheldrake's idea of like the hundredth monkey stuff like that and uh, that all could also maybe happen we don't know but uh, there's a chance that uh, and I think your example of the Berlin Wall is pretty good because nobody expected that I was I was there <laughs> I mean not in Berlin at the time uh, at the day but here in Germany we watch it on the news yeah. and everybody was like what <laughs> they just open it everybody's just leaving and no there's not even one shot fired not one person is hit or anything it was just like okay it's over now Let's yeah. do something else. <laughs> and it was yeah. totally unexpected. And I, and I think there is the potential for that. I mean, it, it, you know, that, that would be the great blessing of Trump uh, if the kind of lo lack of trust in our public institutions reaches such a threshold that something like that becomes possible in the U.S. Uh, I don't. I don't think that's out of the question. No, I think there's a lot of activity and activism going on now. I mean, I've, I have a few friends in in, in the states, and they're uh super active right now on all kind of fronts uh because now this i mean they've been active before but I've, i'm sure there's a lot of people who've been like just watching tv and and now they are okay we have to go out in the streets we have to organize we have to whatever it takes to change this because this guy cannot be in office any longer i mean just today was and i mean we don't have to go into details but it's he's such an insane guy it's amazing and uh i really hope that actually what we are proposing basically that our whole species kind of is looking or is, is ahead, has thrown itself into this initiatory experience um, and, and kind of created this crisis on a subconscious level so that we can all grow is, is true because I mean what is the alternative is just you know there's is meaninglessness so even if it's you know we, we have to just take this because then we give it the meaning mm. exactly. yeah so I guess I, I'm not sure. I think we kind of have to wrap it up soon because you have to be somewhere else in a f soon. So um, just thinking, is there anything that you think we missed or um, that you want to mention? A lot that we missed. Um, <laughs> of course, that's what the book is for. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, in the book I look at, for instance, the potential of a new paradigm around uh, love and relationship. Um, which is, you know, I think, a controversial aspect still. Um, the question of whether kind of uh, this conscripted monogamy and, and the nuclear family is also kind of reaching a limit. Right. And whether new models of uh, community 
um, might replace that. And I, I particularly focused on one community in um, Portugal called Tamara, which mm -hmm. actually started with Germans. Yes, um, I know, yeah. Which I found Dieter to be Doom? quite... Was it Dieter, Dieter Doom? Doom. Yeah. yeah. I think he's quite fascinating and um, definitely uh, requires a deep thinking, um, you know, whether, whether on, on, on multiple levels, you know, whether we need to have a kind of alternative alternative model for uh, for love and relationship. Right. I, I, I like this uh, whole idea that we spend so much energy in kind of seeking a partner and, and keeping a partner. I mean, at least some people do that. Mm -hmm. If we free that energy up, that would also help uh, in activism. I mean, that's that's an interesting idea, which I've never really thought about too much. But it's true. If, if, you, if I look at myself, <laughs> I mean, right now I've been in a relationship for a long time. But before that, um, especially when you're in, in young, you're kind of that's basically what you do all day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then also think about the um, kind of uh, you know that that you know it, it, because you know men, particularly alpha men, uh, alpha males, will always seek you know sexual um, you know kind of uh, satiation. Uh, they're going to you know, like, uh, do that no matter what. So mm -hmm. if you have, if you have a system where that's sort of illegalized, then it ends up leading to prostitution, which is horrible, global sex trade or illegal affairs, you know, and then, you know, in, in, I mean, in the U S we've had this kind of absurd kind of parade of, um, political figures being disgraced because of their sexual exploits. And it was really, it's like a, it was like a sub theme of the last election, whether it was Trump and right. his, you know, grabbing the pussy or, Bill Clinton and his philandering, or Andrew Weiner and his sexting, mm. and now Bill O'Reilly, who was you know the, the head mm -hmm. mm. Republican dude, you know busted for you know sexual harassment. Roger Ailes busted for sexual harassment. The list goes it's endless. Yes, and so much energy gets consumed, um, you know, in the public sphere by the, by these by these by these things, which are really, you know, the, the hypocrisy is just there because we're, we're we're trying to force people to act against their nature. And and we're and we're not we're not thinking about the design of our society as a whole, you know, to, to allow for people to satisfy you know these 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 these, these needs in, in a healthier way, without you know without having to amass unnecessary amounts of wealth so they can so they can do it through kind of domination, mm -hmm. you know, because um, that's another reason why I think what Tamara is uh, indicating is really crucial if we're going to have a healthy human society in the future. Yeah, that's a very good topic. And uh, yeah, you could we could talk about that for hours, of course. And uh, my, I mean, we recommend everybody to to read your book. Uh, we'll, sure. of course, link to this and, mm -hmm. and uh, give everybody some more information. It's, I think, the Scorpio Verlag in Germany. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you uh, t having the interest and taking the time and happy to talk with you further at some other point. Where are you guys based? Uh, we're actually in the Ruhrgebiet. We're in Dortmund, close to Cologne. Close to Düsseldorf. Düsseldorf. That's where we are. But uh, I have an office in Berlin. We are there quite often. And, and maybe you can... Uh, do you know more about your speaking engagement that we can tell our listeners? Yes, uh, yes, yes. I'm speaking in Berlin at this thing. I think it's called Open Air Tech Conference. Okay. Uh, in like mid July, like July fourteenth, sixteenth. I'm not sure which date exactly. Mm. Yeah, that's yeah. great. I mean, you've w the thing is, uh, we just missed you in Berlin. You've been in Berlin a few months, like two months back, was it, or something? Uh, yeah. And and I, I just found out the day. Actually, I went to Berlin on that day, and I saw it on my somewhere on the web, and I said, "Oh, whoa, he's in Berlin," but I couldn't make it that day. Oh. So uh, uh, there maybe was... maybe catch me in July if you can. Yeah, we'll we'll see. Uh, are you at the breaking convention by any chance? I'm going to be at breaking convention too. Yeah. Oh, then we might be meeting yeah. there because we're going to be there as well. So all right, cool. Uh, that sounds great. Okay, so Daniel, thank you so much, uh, and we'll leave you now to the rest of your day. It's morning in New York. It's afternoon here. Thank you. And good luck, and see you soon. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye. Thanks, Daniel, uh, uh, for a really great. Uh, conversation it mm. was short yeah unfortunately an hour is just way too short for all these for topics this. yes yes for this topic uh, but as we said in the beginning it's uh, hopefully inspires you to check out his book where he of course elaborates on all the themes we just touched on uh, and also some we didn't even get to because it's just uh, a way way too much stuff in there um, I also recommend his older books, especially if you are interested in the psychedelic experience. I think he really uh, gives some really interesting, 
has some really interesting ideas in there and it's it's they're all written very um on a very personal s uh, from a very personal perspective mm. so you really can delve into his mind and uh you are with him on his journeys in this world and <laughs> the other world and uh, they're both very interesting and as we said also check out his podcast if you're interested in all these ideas um if you're interested in our podcast it's called viele wege führen nach om in germany it's a very difficult title <laughs> <laughs> but uh maybe you'll find it uh, if you if you google us uh and you probably see now the title on your iphone or ipod if you found this podcast when you while you were searching for daniel pinchback we also have other english speaking guests most of the time the podcast is in german but uh once in a while we have guests uh that might be interesting from abroad from abroad right yeah. so uh for our german audience of course you know where to find us viele wege führen nach om .com and on facebook viele wege führen nach om and we're also on patreon so if anybody wants to help us out with a few bucks then just go to patreon and uh, look for viele wege führen nach om we have to say a very very big thank you to frank nette and jens haselhoff who are our new sponsors thank you so much for helping us out uh it's very much appreciated and um twitter vwfno uh you can find us uh you can send me an email roland at uh, mondo23.com uh mm -hmm. so whenever you have a comment or an idea or of course we also appreciate you writing a review on itunes or maybe some some tips on on future guests that English would be English. appreciated yeah english yeah. spoken guests. yeah we can only speak english and yeah. german so sorry for french japanese or swahili guests i <laughs> kind of uh, can help there yeah anyway so yeah i think that should be it for now and uh thank you so much for listening i hope you enjoyed it we enjoyed it and uh we always say uh peace be upon you <laughs> <laughs> of course we say that in germany usually peace yeah yeah <laughs> 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 alles gute auch beruflich namaste und tschüss, tschüss.